is December 30th of 1999, a momentous occasion as the world was preparing to say goodbye to a millennium and also praying that their electronics won't turn on them come Y2K. But for one man, it kinda did. In the dead of night at 3.30 a.m., his doorbell went haywire, constantly ringing. He jumps out of bed and rushes to the door, but when he opens up, he finds a young girl holding her throat, covered in blood. She couldn't talk, but it's not going to take a rocket scientist to know what to do next. What is your emergency? I have a little girl just rang my doorbell. The young girl is 10-year-old Crystal Searles, and when the world would hear her story, not only was it heartbreaking, but incredibly inspiring. She didn't realize it at the time, but her courage and ability to outsmart her assailant would end a trail of unsolved murders spanning decades and bringing to justice one of the most blood-hungry serial killers in history. My name is Monks. And this is going to be a story we all can be inspired by. <sighs> For Crystal Searles, it was a magical time in her life. She was moving to Del Rio, Texas. But of course, for a 10-year-old, that wasn't the cause for all this excitement in her heart. It was because... She was moving right next door to the best friend she had in the entire world, Katie Harris. And for the first order of business for Crystal, when she arrived, was to spend as much time with Katie as possible, which meant sleepover time. Now, if you were a 10-year-old girl in the late 90s or early 2000s, the only things to talk about were the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, or Britney Spears. They would stay up all night talking in Katie's room, Crystal on the top bunk, and Katie on the bottom. They chatted exhaustively and eventually would fall asleep. And then the nightmare would begin. This is Tommy Lynn Sells, completely devoid of empathy, sympathy, a psychopath in every sense of the word. He's only 35 when this mugshot was taken, but he had been wreaking havoc for 20 of those 35. Now his story is a video in itself, and if you wanna catch that in the future, be sure to hit the subscribe button. We're trying to get to 20K sooner rather than later, so with your help, we can achieve that. Thank you, ahead of time. So let's get back to that disturbing night. Now, everyone in the Harris household was fast asleep outside, Tommy Lynn Sells was lurking around the property, trying out the windows, some doors, nothing was open. He was just looking for a way in. And with him, he had a large 12-inch butcher knife. And he had only one motive, and that was to kill somebody. Now, I'm going to show you some police footage of Sells himself showing the police what he did to get into the house what he did to the people in it and there's just something puzzling in this video and well actually i should say it's a little bit disturbing knowing what cells is capable of so just pay attention to the video see if you feel the same way that i did and uh let's just watch authorities took cells back to the harris hole the foot in here was open so basically, he crawled in the first open window that he could find. Now, once he was inside the house, he looked into a room and saw a young girl sleeping on the bed by herself. Now, the girl sleeping on the bed was Mark Searles, and that's Crystal's younger sister. And she would actually avoid death twice this night. And this would be the first instance because Cells hovers over her for a full minute clutching that knife ready for his first kill of the night but then decides to have a look around first and lets the child sleep now the second instance that mark would be spared this night was actually a situation that occurred earlier she would be told by crystal 
that she couldn't sleep with her in Katie's room, that she had to go sleep in the spare bedroom by herself. Crystal's reasoning was that she and Katie wanted to have private conversations. And according to Mark, in a future interview, she went to bed fuming at her older sister. But in retrospect, she probably would not be here today if she slept in that room. Now back to the video. He saw that there was a door ajar, a cross, and he quietly nudges the door open and peers inside, and he sees two girls sleeping on a bunk bed. Of course, that would be Crystal and Katie, so just to paint a better picture, the house was dark, only lit by moonlight and a few electronics, but enough that Cells was able to comfortably walk around. So he leaves Katie's room and walks to the living room, and eventually he would see the master bedroom peek inside there. He would find Katie's mom and her sister asleep on the bed. Not wanting to deal with an adult, he decided to head back to the easy targets. You know, girls sleeping on the bunk bed. Now, what I'm about to tell you is extremely disturbing. And if you're especially adverse to the harm of kids, please just go ahead and skip the next two minutes. It won't be worth it. Spare yourself the heartache. I'll count to five. One, two, three, four, five. I look in here and there's uh, two girls sleeping in here. I woke this girl up. I cut her bra and, and I cut the side of her, uh, whatever she was wearing, uh, shorts. And shorts. Yeah. yeah. And, and she jumped up and told this girl to go get her mom. He gives the girl sleeping on the bottom bunk, which would be Katie, a nudge, a shake, and says, wake up. And Katie would wake up, but to a searing pain on the side of her body. She's awake, but she's not comprehending what she's seeing. This bearded man hovering above her, and he was cutting her bra off, her shorts off, with this large knife, and he wasn't doing it very tactfully because he was taking bits of flesh with him as he was doing it. She screams. She jumps away from him and off the bunk bed. She tries to get Crystal to wake up as well. She yells at her to go run to the next room and get her mother. And she tried to come over here, and I stabbed her, like right here somewhere. You had a knife with you? Yeah. Authorities were stunned by Cell's detached attitude as he described what he did that night. I stabbed her here, and then she like jumped back, and then, then I, you know, well, cut her like, like this right here. Uh -huh. And she fell down right here. Uh -huh. And then uh, I, re I think I done, reached down there and done it one more time. What Crystal realizes is that he had not acknowledged her. He probably doesn't even know that she's there. This is what's going on in her 10 year old mind. As much as she wanted to scream, jump off and try to help her friend she let's just say smart enough to know that it was probably too late for katie and there wasn't much that she could do anyways so she just basically laid back down closed her eyes and pretended that she wasn't even there and it seemed to work because she could hear the footsteps walk towards the door but then, the footsteps started to walk back. And then she heard the voice that would probably haunt all our nightmares for the rest of our lives. He said, little girl. And this little girl up here, uh, I walked over here and I went like this. Severing her windpipe and cutting her vocal cords just like her friend. She rolls away, holding her throat, and falls off the top bunk with a thud. Now, I want all of us to be real with ourselves, okay? What would we do in this situation, okay? We're holding our throat, gasping for air. Uh, if I'm speaking for myself, I'd be writhing on the floor like a fish, okay? I wouldn't have the wherewithal 
to think of anything else but the pain, gra gasping for air. But this little 10 year old girl had the wits about her to forget the pain, forget that her best friend had just been murdered right in front of her, forget fear in general and laid completely still as she was bleeding out. And with her eyes closed, was the scary man staring at her? And then she would hear his footsteps come towards her. But then she would hear his footsteps walk away. She had done it. She had actually fooled him. And she knew the coast was clear when she heard the door close behind him. Now when she felt it was safe, Crystal begins to crawl to Katie. And as she got closer, she could hear Katie still gasping for air. You know, and as sad as a scene as this is for anybody, Crystal was just happy that Katie was still alive. She started rubbing Katie's back, trying to soothe her as best she could. She wanted to tell her that everything was going to be okay, but there was no voice coming out of her. So she did the next best thing that she could think of, and she tried to give her friend effectively a hug with whatever strength that she had. And uh, she didn't know it at the time. Katie had probably died at that very moment pretty much in her arms, not knowing where this bad man was, if he was still in the house or did he wind up killing everybody? She opens the door and finds the closest exit that she could find. And once she was outside, remember this, she had just moved here. This whole area is still foreign to her. She locks into a light that she sees in the distance and she just goes towards it. Now, Crystal's mother, Pam, unfortunately, was more than 700 miles away at their old house, finishing up the move. Now, at 6 a.m. in the morning, she is woken up by the most horrifying call of her life. Pam drops everything and rushes to her daughter's side, not knowing what her daughter's state would be by the time that she got there. It would be the longest journey in any parent's life. When Pam finally got to her room, she saw her little girl, tubes sticking out everywhere. And with tears in her eyes, she asked Crystal, are you okay, my angel? Mommy's here. Unable to speak, Crystal uses a pen and paper to communicate. The one thing that Crystal really wanted to know was that Katie was okay. Pam tried to avoid the question because she knew the answer would devastate Crystal. But the young girl kept pressing the issue. And we could only imagine the heartbreak in the room when Pam told her that Katie was gone. Crystal's innocent little heart, even though she saw what happened to Katie, held on to every ounce of hope that her best friend was still alive and now knowing that she was gone crystal was ready to nail that son of a bitch to a fucking wall so from her hospital bed crystal immediately begins to write out a detailed description of katie's killer she hands it over to the detectives she's still in the hospital this is only a day in and then a sketch artist comes in and creates this composite. It would circulate the city, it would circulate the stake, and it would come right back around to Del Rio. When a friend of the Harris's family would recognize the picture as looking like this used car salesman that had interacted with the Harris family. A man named Tommy Lynn Sells. The police would show up in Crystal's room again with a photo lineup of four potential culprits. Crystal's eyes darted from one picture to the next until her gaze nearly burned a hole in the picture of Tommy Lynn Sells. She points at it. The detectives immediately head out to make their arrest. And just two days after this vicious attack, the police storm into a trailer home and was actually surprised to find a timid, cooperative, 
Tommy Lynn's cells inside. He was arrested without any type of incident. But what makes this, I guess you could say, interesting was his remark as he was being taken away. He would say, I'm glad that I finally got caught. Now, detectives at this point making this arrest, of course, there was just no way of knowing that there was just this greater surprise waiting for them at the police station. Because without any prompting, any prodding or prying from detectives, Cells decides to voluntarily confess to multiple murders and attempted murders over a two decade long killing spree in as much detail as he himself could recall and that's how the footage of the walk around the harris's house came to be he wanted to tell everything as if he was clearing his conscience but he's a psychopath a sociopath a narcissist okay it wasn't to clear any fucking type of conscience because he didn't have one it was for notoriety sorry if i'm defaming him but he wanted all the credit for all those killings all those years that he wasn't being credited for he wants it now because he got caught anyways he was going to prison forever anyways now he wants that shine that notoriety the police by the end of it tallied 70 crimes that he confessed to now i want to quickly bring you back to the question that i posed earlier if anything in the walkthrough video felt strange to you doesn't it appear that the police are a bit nonchalant look i get that he was very cordial when you arrested him but this is not a human being he's in the house that he cut the throats of two kids he confessed to rapes murders and get this he even told them that if they didn't get him he would have done it again and here he is walking around without any type of restraints at all what if he decided to grab a knife and really slit this cop's throat yeah he'd be shot dead in good old texas but so would a cop baffling and as I was looking at his mugshot, I just couldn't help but think that there is actually one actor, another piece of human waste that could play him if they ever decided to make a movie of this garbage, and that would be Danny Masterson. Do you guys see it? I see it. And if you guys want me to do one on Danny Masterson, I'd be happy to. If anyone's interested, just let me know in the comments below. So Crystal Searles, the brave 10 year old girl had just experienced trauma no child should ever have to witness, let alone endure. But thankfully, she was recovering in her hospital bed. Now, of course, Crystal is more than ready to testify against Tommy Lynn Sells to put him away forever. The problem was to do that, she would have to see him again in court and he would just be a matter of feet away now just imagine how terrifying that that thought would be for any of us to see this fucking monster again and it did weigh on her nerves greatly she was getting cold feet and uh this story would make national headlines and it would be picked up by the extremely popular show america's most wanted who wanted to document her story during the taping producers of the show could see that crystal was noticeably still shaken by the events and having a very hard time deciding to face cells now they made this decision that would prove extremely pivotal in helping crystal find that courage to walk into that courtroom and that was having her sit down with another young girl same year 1999 that went through a similar trauma and her name was christy reed and she survived some brutal attack in 1999 when she got home she found her sister dead and the attacker attacked her slitting her throat as well how many stitches did you have or sutures or? i had 60 stitches in my neck seven in my wrist and 25 staples in my stomach do you sleep in your own bed yeah i 
sometimes do, but I'm sometimes scared, so I sleep with my mom. Yeah, my mom had to sleep with me for like three months. And then after that, I slept with the light on forever. And I, can, I still cannot sleep by the door. It just uh, creeps me out. Now, she was 14 at the time when she stood in court to face the man that killed her 16-year-old sister and tried to kill her. And she would share how she found the strength to go through it. Do you have any tips or anything like Don't look at him? <laughs> I don't know. I really didn't have anybody help me. I just had to do it on my own. But just concentrate, like... Concentrate on your, like, your friend's name was Katie? Yeah. Like, concentrate on her, because, like, you're helping her and yourself, like, by putting this guy away or whatever. And so just, like, think, think that she's still, well, think that she's still here and, like, you're, like, helping her. It's scary, but once you get it out, you're like, you feel a lot better. You're like, that feels good. <laughs> yeah. She's so like, you got it out. Yeah, am I scared because he's going to be sitting right there? Yeah, it's like he's sitting right here and then you're like sitting right in front of him. Now, are you guys ready to choke up just a little bit? Because this clip is going to be a tearjerker, okay? Let me set it up for you guys. So... When Christy Reed and her mother were watching, you know, the clip of this interview, they noticed that Crystal's eyes kept darting to Christy's ring. Now, this ring had a special meaning when they were talking. It was the ring that Christy said she was wearing that got her through it. She would spin it on her fingers, as weird as it would sound, give her the strength to testify i guess crystal found that story very powerful and i'm to tell you that this is to help guide you for tomorrow okay Come on. It was the cross ring, the same ring that had given Christy so much strength when she had testified against Paul Warner Powell, the same ring that had fascinated Crystal. And I was just kept looking at it and telling her how pretty it was. As you face this journey from the moment you begin, <laughs> oh my God, will guide you and you'll have the strength to win. So while twirling and fidgeting with that special ring on the stand, Crystal gave her testimony in tears and put Tommy Lynn Sells to death. So Crystal came face to face with a serial killer and survived. Her recovery would not be easy. And the trauma of not only losing her best friend, but witnessing that murder will probably leave a void in her heart but as the years pass christy showed the same tenacity like she did when she was 10 years old escaping a serial killer but she would now focus that strength into the people that she loved as well as herself my name is monks i hope you found this story inspiring i hope you found it to be helpful now go protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect you. Now, it is a tad weird to me that Tommy had 70 victims and Masterson was on the 70s show. No, meh. <laughs>